There are three Greek words used by the inspired penman that translates our English word or into our English word, redeem. One of those words means to go into the marketplace to buy a captive. Another word means to bring out of the marketplace that which is bought. And the third word means the third word means to set that person free, to let the person go, in other words, after that person has been bought. And it takes every one of these words to tell the whole story of sin transgression of God's law among men, 1 John 3, 4. Of the bondage, slavery, that that brings us into. And then redemption. We have a song that extols the theme of redemption, more than one song. Redeem, how I love to proclaim it. But I wonder how much time we give in our study of the Bible to reflecting on the meaning of redemption. Redemption refers actually to the entire work of Jesus in delivering us from the guilt, the penalty, the power, the presence, and the very consequences of sin. Of course, a great many people nowadays don't even reflect upon sin. If they do, it's to mock it, make light of it, not make think of much about it. But you take sin, what it is that man's guilty of it and thereby separated from God. And then you take redemption and you see just how important a study of what the Bible says concerning buying man from the bondage of sin, buying him back. So in this study of the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ, our Savior, I first of all want to look at the need, the need of redemption. In view of what we said by way of introduction, it's obvious that sin has taken man captive and held him and holds him, in generally speaking, in a very bitter bondage. Paul expresses that sentiment to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 26. He says men need to re recover themselves, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I cannot conceive of Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. I certainly cannot conceive of living today in this world and it be completely free from sin and the consequences of sin. I, I just can't do it. If you sit down and begin to take a pen and write down everything that is in this world because man has sinned, I don't know how much you'll write down. In Hosea 3, 9, the great prophet said, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. And that's what we do when we sin. We make the choice no matter the allurements of Satan to get us to violate God's will, we make that choice. Something has to appeal to us. Something's important to us more than God in serving Him. That's the world we live in. And what is sad is that so many religious people who name God as their Father and the Bible as the Word of God and even will say we must follow what it teaches and acknowledge Christ as Savior when you begin to examine the things that they teach and the way that they conduct themselves, they're living out of harmony with the will of God. 
And we don't want to be found in that way because all that God has done to save us won't impact us, won't be any good for us as long as we keep such a disposition of heart. Someone has written, and I want to read it to you, trying to emphasize what sin has done to us. He wrote, through sin, Satan tries to depose God from his sovereignty. Satan tries to abuse God's goodness and vilify God's wisdom. He insults and denies God's omniscience. Through sin, Satan tries to pull God off his throne and abuse God's authority. I would pause here and simply say, look at how Satan treated Jesus when he tempted him. And you see all of this caught up in that. He went ahead to write, sin abuses God's justice, as if God would not punish wickedness. Sin abuses God's power, as if God could not act against evil. Sin abuses God's wisdom, as if God's laws were not right and reasonable. Sin abuses God's omniscience, as if God did not see and observe. Sin abuses God's long suffering, patience, and forbearance, as if God's Spirit would always strive with man. Sin abuses God's warnings, as if God were not to be feared. Sin abuses God's promises as if God could not fulfill his word. Sin abuses Jesus Christ, his death, his blood, his righteousness, and his salvation. Sin is an abuse of the Holy Spirit too. It is a resisting, a quenching, and a vexing of the Spirit. Sin is an abuse of heaven. Sin built hell and produced the worm that never dies. Sin kindled the fire of hell that shall never be put out. I thought that was a pretty good uh, effort to, to impress upon us the need to be redeemed because we can't recover ourselves from that situation. And let me point out to those who need to obey the gospel or any member of the church who's harboring a sin they have not repented of. The reason that you do not repent of a sin as a child of God, knowing that the sin is there, is because of these things I just wrote. Satan sold you and every one of them, or some of them. The reason that you can know what the Bible says one must do to become a Christian the way God remits all past sin so that you can become a Christian or be added to the church is because some of these, if not all of them, don't impress you. You know what that means. You're in the clutches of Satan. He's having his way with you. We sing a song sometimes to remind ourselves as free moral agents we have to let God have his way with us if we're to be saved by him through Christ. But when we know what the Bible, admitting that it's the Word of God, teaches us to do to become a Christian and teaches us what to do as a Christian to be faithful. But we don't do it. Then Satan has his control over us. He sold us this bill of goods I've been reading right here. He has deceived us to thinking it'll never happen to me. Now, you might not articulate that in just so many words, it'll never happen to me, but that's really what's working in the back of your mind. This is for somebody else and not me. Some way you have believed a lie. Now, who's the father of lies? Why, it's Satan himself. He originated the whole thing. So he sold us on that bill of goods. He sold us that, what is all this? Bible business, God business, church business, baptism business. What is all that? I'm making it just fine where I am. 
Now, you might give answers to the people that know what the proper answers are when they ask you about things, but as long as you fail to comply with the will of heaven when you know what it is, you're saying, Satan has control of me. He holds me in bondage. I'm a slave to Satan. And by the way, we're all slaves to either Satan or Christ. It's by our own choice. Remember the writer of Hebrews pointing to Moses that he chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And then, of course, it says they were for season. And that's true. Whatever pleasures we have that comes to the flesh and this time and space that we live in now, that's all just for season. What God offers through Christ and the gospel of Christ is power to save us, Romans 1, 16, is eternal life. If we will devote ourselves humbly and in love and faith in God and Christ, the system of salvation, salvation forever, no death, no consequences of sin. When this life is over, eternal life. Sin is a malicious abuse of man. Remember, God created man. Of his soul, of his body, of his time, and of his riches. Listen to the weeping prophet Jeremiah as he labored in the last days of Judah and Jerusalem. He described men who had forgotten God. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's house. Jeremiah 5, 7. Fundamentally, he's talking about spiritual adultery with all the idolatrous nations and literal adultery because that was all involved in the worship of those idols. The point is, we cannot begin to appreciate redemption unless we think about the position we've, we've been in, in bondage to Satan, captured by Satan, shackled to him as a slave because we will not receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save our souls. Because we resist the truth when we know it applies to us, whether in becoming a Christian or living the Christian life. There's nobody that could satisfy this and could make salvation possible except Jesus Christ. He is our Redeemer. Now let's look at the one who redeems. Paul wrote, speaking of Christ, in whom we have our Here's our word, redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses against him, according to the riches of his grace. Remember the Greek words, going into the marketplace, buying the person that's there. This all has to do with slavery. Bring him out of the marketplace and set him free. That's what Christ did. Our marketplace was for him to come human and come into it here, be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, and thus he could die on our behalf. Now, why did he do that? Well, first of all, if you'll seriously think about it, does that not say something about the worth of your soul? If it doesn't, I don't know what would. Then notice what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. But of him ye are in Christ, who was made unto us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, in the Lord is in 
the spiritual body of Christ, the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1, 18. To get into the Lord, one must be baptized into Christ as a penitent believer, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Acts 2 and verse 38, Acts 17 and 30. We minimize all too often what it is to be in the Lord. You know, there are very few people in this world that are in the Lord. When you look at all the people on this earth, very, very, very few of them are in the Lord. How thankful we ought to be for the redemption. No wonder, redeemed, I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Then notice what is written in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, 9, and 10, speaking of Christ, for thou wast slain and did purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and madest them to be unto our God a kingdom and priest and they reigned upon the earth. That's a description of the faithful in Christ from the time the church was established. It's interesting to note that he says and they reigned upon the earth. How is it that we as members of the church, Christians, reign upon the earth? Well, we've overcome sin. We're in the favor of God. We walk in the light as He is in the light. That being the case, the blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. Satan cannot touch a faithful child of God in the sense of causing him to lose his soul. So he would say also in Revelation 2, 10, Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. This Redeemer, of which we've been spending a long time on in Isaiah, as he was prophesying of him, is of God. He is God, in fact, John 1, 1 and 2, and verse 14. In Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord hath, hit, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. How could that be? Well, first of all, he never sinned. Thought, word, and action. I sometimes sit down and think about that. There was never a thought that crossed our Lord's mind that was out of harmony with God's will that violated the will of his Father. There was never a word that passed his lips that was not complete compliance with the will of his Father. There was never any action or anything he didn't do that was not in complete harmony with God. That just, I say fascinates, it just overwhelms me to know that he could do that. And why did he do it? As a man, as much man as you are, I am a human being, he did it for us. And we ought to make it, we ought to make it very personal. He did it for me. All of our service to God ought to be thought of as an individual serving God and God taking note of our love for Him and our faith in Him. As children of God, members of His church, redeemed and proclaiming it by our thoughts, words, and actions, we ought to rejoice that God has made that way through Christ, that we can be in such a relationship with Him in His spiritual body, the church, to which He added us, when we were baptized into Christ, that we have such hope and such gladness and such rejoicing. It helps us better understand how the Ethiopian eunuch who was limited under the law as to how he approached God under the temple worship could now go on his way rejoicing because nothing stood between him and God save the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And he ever lived with the making intercession for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, concerning Christ being the one who redeems us, who buys us from the bondage of sin which we're in, him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I like that latter part. I like all of it, but I like that latter part. Because by what Christ did, as a sinless, 
being going to the cross, thus not dying for anything he did that was wrong, but dying on your behalf and my behalf. What he did was make it possible for us to become the righteousness of God. Where? In him. What does that say about the importance of the church? Because we're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, as penitent believers. The Lord adds us to his church. That's where we are made righteousness in him. The righteousness of God. We have nothing to glory of. We simply submitted to the will of he who died for us. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Who purchased us for the bondage in, to Satan that we were in. And thus in the church we are his righteousness. We have nothing to brag about. We learned the truth. And we accepted it in the only way a person can. Through belief and obedience to that truth. Thus is the author of eternal salvation. Jesus is unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 verse 9. Wouldn't you think that Satan doesn't want you to be baptized? And those of you who have not been. Does that begin to tell you something about yourself? You don't want to obey Christ. Well who can you think is the origin of that? Who does not want you above all beings that exist to obey from the heart Jesus Christ? Why, Satan himself. Well, we see the one, and that's Christ, who is our Redeemer. But then let's look at the means of redemption. Wherein lies the power of Jesus for redemption? So what is the means of our redemption? Peter wrote to Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. You can see that in the predictive element of prophecy that is Isaiah 53. But I like to think of that, he bore my sins, whatever they are. I make it quite personal. He bore my sins. On the tree. Sometimes when I'm meditating on things about the Lord's Supper, I realize I show forth his death till he come, but he died for me. Nobody else around, although he died for all. It's personal to me. When I was baptized, that was personal to me. I don't know about you, but I think it was. When I worship God, that's personal to me. I don't know what anybody else is doing. I know what they ought to do. But I know that it's the collective, individual persons worshiping God that's acceptable. So in the sacrifice of himself on Calvary, Christ then accomplished our redemption. Now listen to what Peter said reminding Christians about this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that ye were redeemed, past tense, not with corruptible things, with silver or gold from our vein, which means pointless, manner of life, handed down from our fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. You see, every one of those calves and goats and lambs, pigeons and doves, that were offered under the law of Moses. Every single solitary one of them was pointing to the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, Jesus Christ. That also tells us why God, well, it gives us more information of why God was upset when the Jews would not follow the teaching of God offering the best lamb of the flock that they had. Because he certainly was going to offer the best he had to look at it from that standpoint. So it wasn't that they just disobeyed God in choosing which animal to offer. That animal had to be the best because it typified Christ. The blood of Christ then was the price of our redemption. 
The writer of Hebrews would say it this way in Hebrews 9 and verse 22. All things are cleansed with blood. And apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no buying back. The blood of Christ then is appropriated to man by an obedient faith. It's sad that denominational people do not believe in an obedient faith. But wouldn't you expect a false religion authored, of course, by Satan because anything false is, but try to get people not to be baptized into Christ to obtain the remission of sins. Well, certainly you would expect that, as you would any other error concerning salvation. Well, with that in mind, the means of redemption, and the one who did the redeeming prior to that, Christ, consider then the conditions of redemption. A great many people don't believe the Bible teaches that there are conditions that men must believe and meet to be redeemed by Christ. They can't explain to you really how you can benefit from these things you don't deserve and could not merit and cannot merit without obedience, but they try. But there must be some response on the part of man. And there has to be a response from us that is not attempting to earn it as if we can actually work and get salvation as a paycheck for work we've done. There must be a way that we can do it because salvation is free. Their idea of salvation being free, there's not a thing in the world you can do. And the whole system of Calvinism that says Everybody in this world is either born lost or born saved and neither class can do a thing in the world about it. Is trying to say you can't do anything in order to be saved. God must do it all. There's nothing in the Bible that says God must do it all. When he saved Noah and his family from the flood, did God do it all? Galatians, or rather Genesis 6 and verse 8, it says, Noah found grace in God's sight. That's favor. Well, was he saved by grace only? He found grace in God's sight. Strange that he would find favor in God's sight, that is, God would favor him to see him escape the flood. And yet the very next thing is God is telling him to build an ark of gopher wood, gives him the dimensions and tells him what to do all about that. Obviously, Noah did not think he was saved by grace only because verse 22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now let me ask you something. If Noah had not done all God commanded him in building the ark, would grace alone have saved him? Because he found grace in God's sight. There's no doubt about that. The Bible explicitly, just so many words says it. So way back there in the patriarchal age, in the book of Genesis, the book of origins, we see how one responds to the grace of God. Well, when we speak of Christ being the Redeemer, the only one that can redeem us, then we need to understand as God through Noah gave conditions, though he found grace in God's sight, and Noah had to comply with him, and he did. None of that said that Noah was trying to earn his salvation from the flood. It did say that his faith was so strong in God and in the system God ordained to save him from the flood that he complied with it. And so it's always been that the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. So all in respect, the Bible readily admit that sinful man is redeemed by the blood of Christ. But the Bible states, by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man, Hebrews 2, 9. Well, let's just stop right there. If man is saved solely by the grace of God and nothing else, and Christ is tasted death for every man logically follows that man is saved 
But it's not all the Bible teaches on it. Remember how much we emphasize you must take all of what the Bible says in its immediate context, remote context, on a given subject before you try to reason with it and draw a conclusion. Listen to this. For narrow is the gate and straightened is the way, reading the American Standard Version 1901, that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 14. If Christ tasted death for every man, how can he say, few there be that find it? If he tasted death for every man, every man has it. These two verses must harmonize. Well, just remember Noah finding grace in God's sight. Yet God gave him all about the ark. And Noah kept the commandments without earning a thing. He just took God at his word. And that's the simplest definition of faith you can have. And that faith was a living, active faith. It was an obedient faith. So for what conditions does the blood of Christ cleanse and redeem from sin? Well, of course, there must be some way that we contact the blood. I don't think anybody would say today that says Christ is the Savior and he shed his blood for the rest of our sins and we must contact the blood would teach that, well, we've got to figure out a time machine, go back to Calvary, stand underneath the cross, have the blood of Christ actually drip upon us, go with the dead body into the tomb, stay there till God resurrected him, and then come out. And there we are, blessed by the redemptive power of Christ. Nobody can do that. It's absurd to even speak that way. But listen to what the Holy Spirit through Paul said to the church at Rome as he reminded them of how they benefited from the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, who tasted death for every man. He starts and says in verse Three of Romans chapter 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? I wonder how many people read that and say, well, why is that the case? Why are we baptized into His death? Well, let's read further. Therefore, Conclusion based upon preceding facts and reasoning correctly with them. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man's crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Let's pause there. And jump a little ahead. We often quote Romans 6, 17, and 18. Remember, this is written to Christians. They've done all of this. These words are written to them, not because they don't know them, but to motivate them to stay faithful, to live as new creatures in Christ. And he thanks God in verse 17, that is, Paul does, that they have ceased to be servants of sin. Well, now, remember, we're talking about the redemptive process. We're in bondage to sin when we're outside of Christ. We're chained to Satan. We're a child of Satan, as it were. And so, these servants of sin, when the gospel, God's power to save, is preached to them, then they've heard of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. But they obeyed from the heart, the inward man. What is the inward man? It's the real you that never ceases to exist, fathered by God, for God fathers our spirits. 
Your parents gave you a body. God gave you your spirit. And when you consider this, you realize he's talking about the willpower of man, the intellectual, rational power of man, the emotion of man. And you're able to see the conscience involved. If you want to try to understand a person, then try to understand it that way because that's the way the Bible pictures the spirit of man. That never ceases to be. So they obeyed from the heart. Every one of what I just said is involved in a person completely obeying God. He said they obeyed a form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What did we read at the beginning of Romans 6? They obeyed a form of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Only after they did that as penitent believers were they new creatures in Christ. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. You were in bondage to Satan. You were servants of sin. But the process of redemption is when you believed and repented of your sins, you completed the transaction by meeting the condition of being buried with your Lord in baptism. You were baptized into his death. Well, you know, just a study of Romans 6 would destroy the idea that one is baptized simply to follow Christ's example. Or that you're saved before baptism at the point of belief only and then you're baptized to get into a certain church and many times after they voted on you to get in. There's nothing like that in Romans 6 or any other place in the Bible where he's dealing with the same subject. But, but then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. So this is the condition or conditions of which we speak. It's amazing to me when you look at the simple way of salvation, that it is simple. What is difficult to understand about what I've said this morning, which is what the Bible teaches. Now look at the realm of redemption, the church. I've already touched on it, but Acts 20 and verse 28, we find Luke recording what Paul said to the Ephesian elders. And he said to them, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. American standards as bishops because they're one and the same. To feed the church of God or the Lord which he purchased with his own blood. You see, every person added to the church by the Lord has been baptized into Christ. That is, They've obeyed that form of doctrine, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Christ shed his blood in his death. Thus we're baptized into his death. When we're redeemed by the blood of Christ, we become a part of the blood-bought body, the church, the family of God. Thus in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, Paul wrote, Christ also is the head of the church being himself the savior of the body. He doesn't promise to save any other institution. He's the savior of the body. But what's the body? Well, there's one of them, according to Paul in that same letter in Ephesians 1 and verses 22 and 23 of chapter 1, says that body is the church. doesn't take much to realize what's being said. So when you minimize the church, the body of Christ, you're minimizing the realm that Christ adds those two who have been baptized into his death, thus contacted the blood, free from sin, new creatures, and the very realm that will populate heaven. You realize that? No wonder, wouldn't Satan want that done? Wouldn't Satan want the church to be opposed, the churches you read of in the New Testament? Certainly he does. You can just look at anything the Bible teaches and Satan's opposed to it. He's going to have a doctrine among men somewhere that's going to oppose whatever it is the Bible teaches. That's his existence. He's the adversary. He's the one that's against anything. Remember what we said in the beginning in reading from the quote I gave? That he's against anything that would exalt God. Then there's continuing redemption in the lesson will be yours. 
So the blood of Christ not only cleanses us initially to become Christians when we became Christians, but I love this. It keeps on continually cleansing. First John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The verbs there in the Greek are present tense, and that means they are continual action, continuing action. The blood we contacted in being baptized into Christ continues to cleanse us as we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So let us not turn from Christ's teachings. Let us not be one of those who hath, as the writer of Hebrews said, hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith we're sanctified as an unholy thing. That to me is a great verse because it, is, among other verses, encourages us to be careful about living like the Lord said as his children. Redeemed, I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And then the song says, his child and forever I am. When all is said and done and we look at things from human standpoint of what's difficult and what's hard, then, you know, God had the hard part. We have the easy part. What is it? Humbling ourselves and accepting what the Bible says and obeying it. That's it. But look at what Satan does to stop us from doing that. Whether it's in becoming a Christian or whether it's in living faithful Christian lives, walking the lies he's in the light. You and I don't like to be told we're wrong. If you want to see people bristle, just tell them they're wrong and they know you mean it in something they really love. And you can see how it works, beginning with Eve and Adam. The woman thou gave us me, she did give me and I did eat. You see, it's not new on this earth. When Satan holds us in bondage and we don't have a humble attitude to receive with meekness the grafted word, then it's easy for us to become stubborn, hard-hearted, and reject the truth, whether it's becoming a Christian or living faithful to the Lord. If you're not a child of God this morning, we give you another opportunity. God spared our lives as good providence that we can obey the gospel and become a Christian. Now remember, if you need to obey the gospel and you stand there, just picture Satan behind you holding you right there. That's what he's doing. He's doing it because you agree to stand there when you know God loves you and he wants you to obey the gospel and Jesus has paid it all. You just simply have to humble yourself, respond, be willing then the rest of your life to live like the New Testament teaches, knowing you're in the mercy and the grace of God in the church of the living God to which he will add you if you will be baptized into Christ as penitent believers. The child of God, what is there in your life that may be that you're holding on to, that you need to give up, take on to be faithful? Don't let that stop you from serving God and benefiting from the redemptive process of God through Christ. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come on the stand while we sing.